So I remember thinking when I first heard the term congestive heart failure that it sounds like it would be incompatible with life. If the heart has stopped, how is the patient still alive? And it certainly is a serious condition, but I have since learned that it does not mean the heart has completely stopped. So today in this video, let's talk about what exactly is congestive heart failure. So it's a medical condition that means the heart has failed to perform its job adequately, which is to support the cardiovascular system and recycle the blood in the body. Now there are many, many pathophysiologies that can be involved. The severity of the disease can vary, and there are a variety of ways we can try to help patients with CHF. But first things first, what exactly is it? And I think a good way to think about this is let's break it down by the three words. So the first one, congestive. Here, I think we can think of it as a traffic congestion. If something is backed up, it's not flowing forward correctly, and in this case, we're talking about blood. So the second word, heart, it's self-explanatory. We're going to be talking about the heart. So we'll come back to this. Now the third word, failure. The diagnosis of this failure is the clinical one, which means we don't go straight to a blood test. It's going to be based on signs and symptoms that we gather from talking to and examining the patient. Of course, there are ways to quantify or to put a number on the degree of this failure. But before we get into the specific symptoms and how to evaluate the severity, let's go back and review the normal function of the heart first. Now, congestive heart failure is a mechanical disease of the heart, so we're going to think of the organ as a pump and review the mechanism of how this pump works normally. So first, we'll divide the heart into right and left. Now, it's the convention in medicine, whether we're looking at an x-ray or other image, to flip the right and left as if you're facing the patient, so their right is going to be your left. So we'll do that here. Next, we're going to divide the top two chambers from the bottom two. Now, the heart has four total chambers, so we'll draw another line here to separate the top from the bottom. The two chambers on the top are called atrium, and the two on the bottom are each called a ventricle. So now we have the four chambers of the heart, of the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. So as you already know, the function of the heart is to pump blood throughout the body. So let's review the pathway of the blood as it travels. First, we have deoxygenated blood in the body, which I will draw in blue here, that will go through the veins and end up in the right atrium first as it enters the heart. Just a quick reminder that all blood vessels that carry blood to the heart are called veins. So once in the right atrium, uh, the tricuspid valve is going to open and the blood will go into the right ventricle. The right ventricle then pumps this deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So that's the bronchial tree with left and right lungs. Now at the lungs, the deoxygenated blood will pick up oxygen. And here we'll start to draw the oxygenated blood in red. The oxygenated blood, which is red now, goes to the left atrium first. Then the bicuspid, or more commonly called mitral valve, opens and it flows into the left ventricle. The left ventricle has the big job of pumping this oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So you can imagine if this system gets congested, meaning it's backing up and the blood is not flowing forward as it should, let's think about what symptoms you might see when the patient comes to your office. Now starting backwards, so the left ventricle, as we said, pumps blood to the rest of the body. Since sufficient oxygenated blood is needed to keep the body's metabolism going, to keep the muscles going, so you can imagine that if we're not getting sufficient blood into the system, one of the primary complaints patients can have is fatigue, especially with exertion, which ups the body's demand and the muscle's demand for oxygen. So let's keep going backwards in the system. If the left ventricle is not pumping out all the blood that we need to the body, then you can imagine that it gets backed up into the left atrium and eventually back into the lungs. We know that the lungs have very thin, permeable vasculature, and a lot of pressure in here will cause pulmonary edema, which is just a fancy word for the lungs becoming wet as the edema goes into the lung tissue. This leads to dyspnea, or shortness of breath, because a wet lung is not an effective lung for ventilating. And an important factor that's associated with this can be orthopnea, which means that the shortness of breath gets worse when the patient is lying down and a little better when the patient is standing up. And this is just due to gravity. 
since we're talking about pooling a fluid here, you can imagine that as the patient stands up, gravity helps some of the fluid to drain out and they can breathe a little better. But when they lie down, the fluid just pools throughout the lungs and the patient can feel like they're drowning. All right, so let's keep going. As the pressure builds up in the lungs, it's gonna get harder and harder for the right side to pump the blood into the lungs. So eventually we're gonna back up all the way to the right side. Now remember the right side receives deoxygenated blood from the body. So as this keeps going, the drainage of the blood into the veins from all over the body is going to slow down. As the pressure builds, this can lead to edema, which is extravasation of fluid into the interstitium. Patients are going to complain of swelling, especially down near the ankles when they've been standing because again, for gravity, it's going to pull all the blood to the bottom. And actually, if you press your finger into the swollen tissue, it will leave a dent there instead of bouncing back like in normal tissue because there's excess fluid. Another cardinal sign of CHF or congestive heart failure is going to be jugular vein distension. Now remember the jugular veins drain blood from the head into the heart. So when the system is backed up, the jugular vein will become distended. And especially as the patient is sitting up, you can actually see the column of blood building up. It's gonna be on the side of their neck. And when you see that, heart failure should be on the list for the differential. I mentioned earlier that there's a way to quantify this condition. If we do an echocardiogram, the computer can calculate something called the ejection fraction of the heart, which is really just a measure of the volumetric fraction of blood being pumped by each contraction. In other words, it measures how effectively the heart is pumping blood to the body. A normal ejection fraction is somewhere in the range of about 55 to 70%. In heart failure, we see a decreased ejection fraction. And finding out this number can help us to quantify how bad is this patient's disease right now and allow us to document the progression of it as we try to treat it. Now, as they say, the best treatment is prevention. Uh, the best prevention for congestive heart failure is avoiding the diseases that lead to it. For example, chronic high blood pressure or ischemic heart disease, alcohol abuse, so on and so forth. Now, to understand why, in the next video, we'll talk about the pathophysiology of heart failure, um, the how of how it happens, and how these diseases contribute to it.